So the Mennonite farm that I purchased my wool from, uh, as I mentioned, is in northern Pennsylvania. And I happen to know that the herding and shearing practices that they use there are very old traditional practices that have been passed down and learned throughout the generation. The shearers are highly skilled and that's what they specialize in. They don't do anything else except for shear the sheep once a year. Um, that's probably not my office better this way. That's that's what they do. They're highly skilled shearers. Um, it's best when the sheep are sheared by hand instead of mechanically, because then you get it's best for the sheep and it's best for the wool. Uh, for the sheep, because a hand shearer can be careful enough to uh, to protect the sheep's skin and only get the wool. Um, a mechanical shear sometimes can cause problems with the wool, causing uh, lacerations, deaths. It can leave the sheep severely mutilated. And um, there have been a lot of PETA investigations on shearing of this type because it causes such a high risk uh, to the sheep. As far as wool goes, whenever you shear the sheep, it, whenever you hand shear them, you get the long individual locks. Now this is actually a bat. It's not a true roving. A true roving would, you would see the long curly locks from the sheep. They would be cleaned, uh, but you would see the individual locks. And for making art yarn, that is a wonderful choice because it gives a great texture and unique uh, factor to the art yarn that you're spinning. This, as I mentioned, it's a bat, which means that you can't really see the individual fibers. They're just kind of all meshed together. Um, and that's caused from a process called carding, which we will go through uh, in a little bit. Um, another thing about shearing the sheep is that um, this is not harmful to them. This is a part of their welfare as a, a natural part of their life cycle. They grow wool naturally, and if they are not shorn at least once a year, then it becomes too heavy, and sheep who have gone a long time without being shorn eventually may become maimed from the weight of their wool, causing, causing them to carry so much weight that they can't, they can't walk. So this is a, a good practice to maintain the health of the sheep, and it's whenever they're hand shorn, it's not harmful to them. And in fact, it's very helpful and beneficial. Edit this part out. <clears throat> so spinning throughout the ages, all throughout history, in all civilizations, we can find um, art such as this painted on walls in ancient civilizations showing women and men spinning wool because in ancient times it was a very respectable practice. Um, in the beginning, as far as we know, uh, some of the very first spindles we have, today we're using a drop spindle which is still uh, an, an older technique, but in the very beginning they used rocks to spin wool and they would they would just twist out a little piece of it and make a little uh, what we call a leader, which is the beginning part of yarn. So they would just twist it together and kind of felt the wool together, the fiber, and then wrap it around the rock and they would spin the rock. And as they would spin the rock, they'd pull the wool into it and then wrap it around the rock and spin it and spin it. So as far as we know, this is the earliest form of spinning. As time progressed, once we got around uh, the time of the Middle Ages, they started adding um, the, the rock with a stick, and sometimes it was a hooked stick. And so they would use the rock to add weight to their hooked stick spindle. Um, for spinning the rock and then using the, um, the stick to wrap it around. Well, once uh, things started to progress, from that point, once the hook stick and the, and the rock were combined, then a huge variety of spindles began to come out. 
with all sorts of mechanical um, aspects to them, pedals and things like that. Even still today, whenever you're hand spinning, they're very rarely done by machine spindles. Even though they have mechanical pieces, they're not electrical by any means. They're run by pedals that uh, turn gears to keep the, the uh, spindle moving. So the cleaning process. This is probably my least favorite part of spinning. Fortunately, this wool I did not purchase raw. I purchased this uh, from the Mennonite farm and they send it to me pre-prepared. However, if you have this right here is called fleece and a fleece is an entire set of, um, is an entire uh, piece of shorn wool from one single, um, from one single sheep. So as you can imagine, sheep uh, walk around in the pasture, they roll around in the grass, they sleep in the dirt, they get in the water. So whenever you um, shear a sheep and you get one fleece, it's full of something that we call vegetable matter. Now vegetable matter is going to be sticks, it's going to be dirt, it's going to be manure, it's going to be a lot of stuff. So the first part of the cleaning process is called skirting. And what they do is they take the fleece these ladies are carding, which we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so they take this, this is fleece that's already been skirted. So you take the fleece and you start to pick through it and you just pick out as much of the vegetable matter that you can find that's on the surface. After skirting, you've pulled apart the locks and you've pulled apart the fibers and then you have a nice fluffy bunch of, um, of wool. The next part in the cleaning process is uh, going to be washing it. So sheep have naturally have uh, grease that protects their skin and it gets into the wool fibers. It's a very, very, very thick grease and it's called lanolin. So before the wool can be spun into anything usable, you have to get the lanolin out. Otherwise it's gonna be sticky and clumpy and it's not, it's not going to look nice. It's going to get dirty very easily because it's going to attract all the dirt particles to it. So in order, there is a caveat to this, however, because wool felts. So anytime it touches hot water, it is in danger of felting. Anytime it experiences agitation, it's in danger of felting. So we kind of have a dilemma here when it comes to washing it because we have to wash it in water that's at least 140 to 160 degrees, hot enough to melt the lanolin, but we can't agitate it. So um, this, this wool and really any raw wool does best whenever it's washed with Dawn dish detergent because it doesn't leave any kind of residue or anything like that. So you have to, for the cleaning process, you just have to get the water really, really hot, not quite boiling, but almost. And then you gently place the wool inside a mesh bag and then put the bag in the water so that the wool isn't moving around. Then you add, the, you add your Dawn dish detergent to the water and you use a stick and just push the wool down into the water and come back up so that the only agitation it's getting is the water going up and down through its fibers. After you do that a, just a few times, so as not to cause any felting, you have to let it sit for about half an hour, um, but not long enough for the water to cool too much because since there's lanolin in the water, if it cools too much, it's going to harden again and reattach itself to the wall. Um, so after, after that washing process, now it's time for carding. So you pull the wool out, you have to let it uh, dry. And once it dries, then you're gonna card. A carding is a second, carding is a second form of skirting. So skirting, remember, was to remove the vegetable matter. So carding, but it's not a complete process because you're just doing it by hand. So carding can be done, you see they have these two paddles, and um, uh, I would use, um, like dog brushes, you know, with the metal bristles, because it's the same, it's the same effect. And so on with carding, you take the paddle 
and you just kind of pick off little pieces of the wool and you stick just one end to the paddle and you fill up the paddle. And you brush it one way, you flip it over and you brush it the other way. And that helps to make sure that all the fibers in the lock are going the same direction. Now remember, I said this is a bat because it's carded. If you wanted to make a roving, you would skip that process and instead use a carder that's circular. So it, it pulls it through, but not back and not in a back and forth motion. Just pulls it through once and then it comes off in a long thing with all the locks still in place, brushing through it, getting away the uh, residual vegetable powder. Okay, so after carding, then we have this thing called a bat, which is what we have here. Um, each of you have your own uh, small pieces, a few ounces worth of bat. But I wanted to show you, right here I have two pounds of bat. You can see, I just want you to it's see. Only two pounds. This is only two pounds of bat, yeah. And this is probably a, a couple of fleeces, I would imagine. But you can see how it's flat. It's wide and it's thick. And, um, but, but all the fibers are going the same direction. And this is then what we use. I've, I've peeled off uh, short strips for spinning. A roving is just a small strip and they're always about this wide, always in a straight line. But a bat is a very large like sheet of cleaned, carded, skirted wool. Now if we wanted to dye it, we would dye it at this stage while it's in a bat. Um, the dyeing process is huge and varied and I won't really get into that except to say that if you wanted to dye the, uh, the wool, you would do it at this stage. Here I have some, um, some yarn that I have already made and washed and dyed. And it's still drying a little bit, but you can see if you want to pass around and look at that. It's a nice goldenrod color, and I dyed that with turmeric powder. So all I did, it can be as simple as that, all I did was um, dissolve some of that turmeric powder in warm water, and then I put a pot of water on the stove, warmed it up almost to boiling, stuck my wool in there, Pour in the turmeric powder solution and um, you know let it sit for 30 minutes pulled it out rinsed it off with vinegar because vinegar helps it to adhere to the fiber and then let it dry and there you go now I have some beautiful goldenrod colored yarn that I can use to make something so roving and batting we've talked about this a little bit you can see this, uh, this picture here is a picture of roving. So roving, whenever you get it, generally it's kind of braided and it looks thick. You can kind of see the different parts here where the roving is braided together. It's very smooth. Um, and actually for spinning, it's a little bit more difficult to spin with um, versus the batting since the fibers are kind of interlocked it's easier to pull it out. It's not so fragile as roving is. Dyeing. Now, you can see here, uh, in this picture, there's a lot of different plants. And plants, dyeing, um, dyeing wool and fibers with natural plant colors is something that, they, that has been happening for generations, centuries. And it's very easy to do. As I, as I told you and showed you, this was done with turmeric powder. Now turmeric is a root. So I imagine in ancient times, they may not have had it in powder form, but turmeric gives off a great color no matter which way you use it. So even if I were to take the root um, and do it whole, I would throw it into some water, let it boil until the water grabs the right color. And this is what you do when using any kind of vegetable for dyeing. You will take the, the vegetable and put it in the water or the plant or whatever and boil it until the water grabs the color of the vegetable. Um, and uh, not all, like carrots, are not going to be a good candidate for you know, dyeing. Uh, but things like this, like flowers, you would 
grind them up and make a paste and then put the paste in the water that you're washing your clothing with. So there are lots of options and especially today there's a lot of commercial options and dye solutions. Kool-Aid is a great option that many many reputable uh, spinners use to dye their yarn because it stains. <laughs> it doesn't come out of your clothes, does it? <laughs> it doesn't come out of the wool either. Beets. Beets. Beets are a great one. Yeah, beets give a wonderful, rich, rich color. Okay, so now we are going to talk about actually spinning. So if everyone can grab a spindle, please. Good. So this is called a drop spindle. There are several different kinds of spindles. This is um, one of the easiest to make. It's great for beginners to use because there's not a lot of fancy pieces and whirls and spindles and bobbins and stuff, flyers and all that stuff. So this is an easy place to start. It has a few uh, parts that I want to go over with you. So it has a shaft. The shaft is gonna be the long dowel in the middle. And then it has a whorl, which is the disc on here. Um, and then it has the hook at the top. And, and those are the only three parts involved in a drop spindle. Now in this picture, <clears throat> this is a bottom whorl drop spindle. A bottom whorl drop spindle is good for plying after you've already made your yarn. So you make a single, which is this. It's only been spun once with one strand of yarn. If I wanted to ply this, then I would take this. If I had two, say a blue one and a yellow one, then I would take the two, you know, twist them together and then twist them on. And then I would have a double plied, a two plied yarn. But today, since we're just doing singles,